Namaste. I'm Sarah Storey, Deputy High Commissioner at Australian High Commission, and I'm here today with Minister Manakshi Lekki, India's Minister for External Affairs and Culture, who has a magnificent background fighting and empowering women throughout a career, first of all in the law and now in, polit in, now in politics since 2014. Thank you for joining us, Manakshi, and welcome to the lawns of the High Commission. Thank you very much, Deputy High Commissioner. It was, it's a pleasure being here. I've known many of your predecessors, and uh, I've been, uh, I mean, we, we've been friends with each other, even in my earlier avatar, so it's always a pleasure knowing each other, getting to know each other, what we both stand for when it comes to women, and uh, rights of uh, the gender. Yeah, absolutely. Shall we take a walk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. be happy. This is about walking the talk. Yeah. This interview is about uh, what we are doing together and particularly hearing your views um, in the week of International Women's Day, which as you know, Minister, is celebrated around the world to, uh, to note the achievements and advancements of women and girls everywhere. Um, this is uh, a long issue that we have looked at together and separately. Yep. And so um, you have an amazing background uh, in um, doing many uh, cases involving women. What uh, made you decide to go into the law when you first entered? Uh, that's a long story. So when I first entered, I was, I still continue to be for my living. I was a lawyer which was practicing taxation right. and <laughs> criminal law. Yes. Uh, but uh, when my children came along and uh, uh, some incident happened and uh, that girl approached me. Mm -hmm. There's a terrible case in the city. And, uh, and that's, I think, 2002. Mm. And from around 98, 99 onwards, I just kind of diverted to this subject and I laughingly say all women are feminists. Any woman with her head over her shoulder is a feminist and feminist means what? You can have 20,000 shades of that. Oh, yeah. So anybody who kind of feels for the cause understands because as a woman each one has had her journey, uh, has gone through some discrimination, has gone through, has uh, sort of broken the glass ceiling in her own way, small way, big way, whatever way. Mm -hmm. Uh, the challenges one faces. Those are common across the globe. And uh, there's uh, uh, underst and getting empowered yourself is part of the process. Yes. By empowering others, you yourself get empowered because that's a voice to your own cause. <laughs> so that's how I kind of got uh, diverted onto this side. And uh, then uh, the rest is uh, history. And you, you worked on a case in particular about um, the permanent commissioning of female officers. Yeah. This is really interesting to me. Can you tell me a little about this? So, um, so uh, government uh, opened up the forces for women empanelment into the uh, forces in various sections. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, uh, this was a 10 year long battle in the court, in the Supreme Court. Uh, some lady officers came to me mm -hmm. and I looked at them, I found them very young and, you know, uh, very smart officers. Yep. Uh, some of them are today handling evacuation also. Ah. So, uh, uh, these officers just, uh, one was from the military uh, uh, army, the other was from the Air Force. They just walked into my office and uh, they said, ma'am, uh, we want you to take up this case. And, uh, and I was that time part of my political beginnings, you know, mm -hmm. on the po political side. Yes. So I said, sure, let's meet up. And I then took them to the party office also. Spoke there, found out. He said, okay, it's a cause which we all stand by and let's take up the matter. The matter was basically uh, within 14 years, less than 14 years of the service, they'll get retired. Right. So the question is, uh, if one has been appointed as a short service commission officer, then your short service cannot be shorter than a male colleague. Yes, I see. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And the benefits which accrue to an officer, uh, even a short service officer, should be identical. 
uh, and once you are working so well that you've, the government has retained you for 13 years, uh, what blocks you at 13 years? Yeah, yeah. What, what happens? Because post 13 years, you end up becoming the commanding officer. I see. So that's yeah. blocking. Yeah. So if you don't become a commanding officer, you could continue. Yes. But when, because you have to sit for commands and certain exams need to be taken up and certain courses need to be done, so few things have to happen. Mm -hmm. So there was a kind of resistance on those issues. Yeah. And we argued on um, material, on facts, on, um, um, on, on principles and uh, how parity is important. And uh, the, the judiciary was with us even in the High Court and the Supreme Court, both, uh, both times the court decided in our favour. And uh, when the Supreme Court says something, <laughs> everyone has to follow. <laughs> so yes. that's what happened. Oh, that's an excellent anecdote. And what a great outcome that you, uh, you achieved. I feel very, very, very satisfied. You know, sometimes you feel a um, uh, few cases in life. It's like your moment. Yes. That's what you kind of stood for. That's what you fought and you got yep. it. And so you've made a difference. You've made a difference. Yes. So, so turning to your career, uh, your transition to politics, um, what role do you think, why does there need to be women involved in politics? What difference can it make? So I think one is of course women's uh, participation for their own sake. Mm -hmm. Why should there be any reason? Why are men there? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so women want to be there, they should be there, yes. as simple as that. Uh, but on the little social moralistic ground, I would say, it's only good for everyone to let women achieve what they are capable of. Mm. It's always a good decision making when you see diversity at the workplace. Yes. So we keep talking about diversity at the workplace. But yep. the biggest diversity is getting more women on the workplace. Yes. So let's have more women on the workplace because that's, I always say, I said the biggest minority in the world are the women. Because when you see the places of power, when you see places of eminence, when you see places which can make a difference, you see less and less women. So if women are on those spots, they will make a difference in the decision making simply because their experiences are different. Yes. Their living uh, methodology is different. Their concerns are different. So I, I would say that if I have to set up a team, who would I set up? I mean, do I get the similar looking, similar sounding people? similar thinking people, then my decision making will be faulty. I have to get all sides. Yes. So when you have to get all sides, why are you keeping women out of those all sides? So one is that. On the other front, I feel uh, even historically, politically, it, it's, it's, it makes sense to have women. Yeah, huh? it, 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 it so, so I would normally say, when people would say, oh, you speak on women issues. I say there are 20,000 other issues on which I can speak and maybe speak better than men, uh, some of the men, and some of the men may speak better than me on the women issues. On yes. gender, you should see more men speaking about it. Mm -hmm. That's what parity is all about because women concerns are not women concerns, these are human concerns. Yes. These are family concerns, these are children concerns, these are concerns of society at large. So why should men not participate on gender issues? Let more men talk about it. Let more men uh, uh, demasculinize themselves and feminize themselves and, and let more females masculinize themselves. Why not? Yes. So exactly. that, is, that is what parity and equality is all about. So Minister, um, you've recently released a book, as I understand it, about the unsung heroes, the women of India's independence struggle. I'm really interested to hear what a woman hero looks like to you. To me, a woman hero um, looks, um, you know, the only image when you ask this question, I get an image of a Harappan uh, bronze which is lying in National Museum. There's this young girl who's standing like this. So I think in terms of appearance, that's what a hero looks like with a held high, with head held high, uh, that exuberating confidence and uh, being herself, being, being what she is like. So that's what a hero looks like.
but uh, when it comes to unsung women heroes of the freedom struggle so i think every nook and cranny of india produced women heroes in every field we had heroes you know just to set the context right thus all these ladies who for their time were doing uh, a brave act for their country's well being for the people's well being standing their ground need to be celebrated mm. especially when india is celebrating 75 years of india's independence so quite obviously the 75 year story must tell the story of women leaders as well which for some reason that's why the book says unsung heroes yeah. so women who sacrificed everything weren't even recognized so that's also the story of india and thus this on the 75th anniversary the women who fought battle for the country need to be celebrated and that book came out for that particular aspect and it's a it's like a quick read it's like a children's book yeah. cartoons and things so that at least people get to know of them mm -hmm. people get to remember them and obviously these people didn't die for the country because they wanted to be remembered but i guess those stories will empower a lot many women uh, to work for the well-being of the society of the country to step forward and do things take the challenge take have the courage mm. and that's the inspiration i think at least you and me would appreciate those women who who stood their ground indeed and uh, did whatever they could very inspiring yeah yeah inspiring for many uh, minister I, as uh, we are partners in the international stage um, yeah. we are partnering together for a free and open prosperous indo-pacific and we work together uh, on promoting women's equality um, how do you think as minister um, countries can work together to promote women's empowerment so of course on the international fora we have Uh, goal 5 SDG and uh, all the right thinking people need to converge their energies on achieving equality and parity uh, in terms of gender in their society and there could be uh, many experiments which we can do together there could be many learning lessons from each other uh, uh, i'll i'll just share one because i know uh, uh, less about Uh, I'm, I one feels that there is more equality in your country, uh, but I'm sure there are challenges everywhere. And uh, you are sitting in this position. I'm sure you've had to break your own glass ceiling to be where you are uh, in diplomacy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I mean, whenever any woman, I meet anyone, I always look at it. Okay, she would have had her own struggle. Nobody makes it, and no society permits it. Uh, uh so so everyone has to go through their own battles and win them uh so they will they will they can be a lot of learning experience from each other mm. and a sense of uh, you know friends holding each other's hand not judging each other but holding each other and that's a difference of attitude which we all need to uh, bring across uh, nationalities and there can be no borders when it comes to women rights yes. and we need to respect that I love that line <laughs> yes we we uniting partnership yeah. not in judgment and measurement yeah. yeah so so uniting partnership is a a, a friendship of equality uh, towards equality and thus uh, many experiments can be learned from each other for example just to share one example Uh, I was with uh, many women leaders uh, in one of the conferences many years ago, and I learned that uh, uh, in the corporate sector, uh, women on boards, uh, on the corporate boards, is a missing thing. While people talk about women in parliament, nobody talks about women in municipality, for example, yes. or on the or in the village council, for example. Uh, so i feel while in our case uh, we got the highest numbers for past 75 years uh, in terms of women representation in the parliament we we've, we've got the highest uh, it's very impressive and and participation of women in politics also 
uh, for example, in 2014, was about 65% mm. of women voted, and uh, in uh, close to 67% of men voting. So there's a margin, but mm. that margin is not really um, negligible. And in 16 states, more women voters voted than men. Out of the 29 states, 16 states, more women voted. So that means more and more women are kind of participating in the decision-making process. Mm. Uh, in, in the sense of law, we brought a law where women directors became an you know, essentiality. Mm. So I think a lot of people from across the globe can pick up that practice. Yeah. That women director by law is imperative for every corporate sector to have. Now, you'll see many companies which do not have women directors. Yes. So, if that law can be introduced, we, we already have that law. Yeah. Yeah. We may have to work at greater participation in other places. Mm -hmm. So, even in terms of municipal and uh, local body elections, uh, we started with 33% mm -hmm. way back in uh, 90s. But today, there are many states which give 50% to women. So participation of women at the local level uh, and local leadership is pretty much equal to men. What has been your struggle? And especially when I know that you've sort of spent a great time in diplomacy. So diplomacy is considered very elitist in every society. It's considered, uh, you know, people who make it there have very little work and more entertainment to do they are uh, constantly dining and uh, lunching together and there's very oh, little work <laughs> so so i want you to describe that side ah. which is which yes. is away from the public gauge yes. and your own struggle because yes. i'm sure if you've made the cut you you would have worked really hard mm. well thank you minister that's an excellent question um i was fortunate enough to be selected into our ministry uh straight out of university uh so i worked very hard to make that cut. Uh, I was very fortunate. As you say, I think that um, our societies, our ministry also, is better with greater diversity in it. Um, when I joined, the, the graduate recruits were around half-half in terms of gender split. Um, but there were, without doubt, um, unspoken barriers to women um, being promoted readily, uh, just in terms of uh, career breaks, etc. But also one thing I've noticed over the 26 years that I've been in diplomacy um, is that uh, women's empowerment has become much more mainstreamed. Um, it is no longer an issue on which if you speak out about it, it is considered unusual or annoying or um, unpolitic. In fact, I think that there is greater recognition that women's empowerment is a mainstream issue and that it it lends itself, as you mentioned earlier, Minister, to better decision making, better processes, uh, more inclusive consideration of views. Uh, I think that another thing that has changed is that women are much more prepared to mentor and support other women. And uh, one change that I've found particularly welcome is among senior men who have been much more prepared to be champions of change themselves and who by their leadership really promote change at lower levels so that everyone feels that uh, women are able to, um, to reach their potential and to op optimise their potential, which leads to the, a better outcome for everybody. But Minister, I thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I know how busy you are with all of the hard work that you are doing on Ukraine and getting the students home. And I thank you very much for your time. And I wish you all the best with, with taking much. that forward. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much.